worship as you're able. A messenger calls, prepare the way of the Holy One. Make a pathway for God straight into your hearts. Bless the Holy One who brings light into the deepest shadows. A prophet proclaims, make way in the desert for the coming of God to live in our midst. Blessed be the Holy One who comes to live among us in peace. Let us prepare ourselves for the coming day of God. Let us worship the one who calls us into life. In the name of God, our Creator, and Christ, our Redeemer, we greet you, whether you're here live with us in the nave, whether you're watching on the live stream, whether you're listening on the radio or on your phone, we are just really glad that you are here. We'd love to know that you're here. So if at some point during the service or after the service, you'll take a moment to check in with us. If you're here in person, you can do so by filling out that sheet that you see in your bulletin. If you're at home, you can text 844-239-5340. Join live and just let us know that you're out there or you can check in on our website. In this moment of Advent, let us greet one another with signs of peace without touching. The peace of Christ be with you.
Please be seated. One of the strange truths of this time of COVID has been that even though some of us are back in person, there are many more of us out there watching and participating in this service. And so, as a way of reminding those of us who are here that there are more than just the people in the pews who are worshiping with us, and a way of reminding those who are out there that they are not alone, this week, to light our Advent candle, we have Teddy Oriola, who will be lighting virtually our Advent candle. We light this candle as a symbol of the peace only God can bring. For God shall purify God's people like gold and silver until they shine forth righteousness. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to God's peace. Let there be light. This morning from the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter, verses 1 through 6, the proclamation of John the Baptist. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Ituria, and Trachonitis and Licinius, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked may, shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, and he loves each and every one of you too. At this time, I'd like to invite the children forward for children's time and to let the families know that the children are welcome to worship with you or come with Miss Holly and myself for time and enrichment in practicing the Christmas pageant. Come on down, children. It is so good to see all of you. Let's take a moment and wave to the people that are watching from home. Hello, everyone. Today, we heard one word said over and over and over again. The word was prepare. Or maybe you'll understand it as getting ready to do something. I thought today we'll play a quick game. How many guys know charades? You know the game charades? Perfect. I'm going to act out a scene that I am preparing to do something. If you can guess what I'm doing, just, just say it out loud, okay? You ready? All right. Preparing. Okay, I got one. Hmm. Washing your hands. You got going to bed. Good job. Okay, let's do another one. Let's give some other energy. So let's do another one. All right. Okay. Making breakfast. Making breakfast. Making breakfast. Making dinner. Making dinner. Good job. You guys are good at this. Oh, it's okay, Sean. All right. In the scripture, we heard prepare the way of the Lord. Oh my gosh, that's a big ask. What does that mean to prepare the way of the Lord? Do we create a party for him? <laughs> what do you think, Sean? Um, we get ready for when he's, um, I think it means that we get ready when the Lord says nice things to us. Oh, I think that's a great answer. Maybe, maybe he wants a parade. Oh, I just don't know. There's so much to think about to prepare the way of the Lord. And you know what? This season of preparation, Advent, we prepare our house, we get a tree, some of it, and we put decorations, and we make cookies, and we visit. Oh, yes, so many things we have to do. But I want to take a moment, my friends. Why was Jesus Christ born anyway. Why was he here? Was it just so we had a cute little story about a baby born in a barn with animals? I don't think so. I really don't think. Violet, did you have one, do you think, reason why Jesus was born? It's all right. Ethan, did you have a decision? Do you think a reason why Jesus was born? Oh, I love that answer. Simplify it. Jesus was born to teach us, to model for us how to love one another, to love unconditionally, to love someone who maybe doesn't look like you, talk like you, think like you, smell like you. We are taught to love all, and Jesus was our teacher. So how do we prepare the way of the Lord? It starts with us. It starts with each and every one of you. You need to prepare your heart to receive and give love. You need to prepare your mind to give and receive love. That is what it means to prepare the way of the Lord. It starts with you preparing yourself for this magnificent season of Advent and the miracle of Christmas and of love. 
Let's bow our heads and talk to God about this for a moment, and then we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your beloved Son, Jesus, to be our teacher, to be our role model, to teach us how to love one another unconditionally. Help us with that. It is sometimes hard to love everyone all the time. Be with us when we don't feel that love and remind us that it's our job to love all. And as Jesus taught his friends to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Please be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Have you ever been lost? Not just taken a wrong turn or the wrong exit or missed the sign or something, but really lost. Like you didn't know where you were, like you knew you went wrong somewhere, but weren't exactly sure where it was or how to get going again, you know. Lost. Granted, it's harder to do these days, as so many of us carry around in our pockets this little device that is there to tell us exactly where we are at any given moment, and so long as we don't route off into a lake or something, we can almost always find our way again, recalculating. (laughs) So long as the battery is good, so long as the signal is good, So long as the journey we're on is one of roads, we can almost always find our way. Only therein lies the rub, doesn't it? Because not every journey in life is one of roads, which means, as hard as it is to believe, there are some moments in life when we can point exactly to where we are on a map. and still find ourselves completely and utterly lost. Maybe some of us are there this morning. Maybe most of us are there this morning. looking around at our world and asking ourselves, how did we get here? Like Miss Clavel in the middle of the night, we know that something's not right. Only we can't exactly articulate it. There's this kind of malaise that seems to have fallen over us, this mistrust, this fear, this deep anxiety that we just don't know exactly where to place. Sure, some of it is the pandemic. It's hard to go through something so strange, so life-altering, to have so many of our normal routines turned on our heads, on their heads, and not find ourselves at least a little unsettled. And with the news of every new variant, from Delta to Omicron, that sense of unease just grows. We find ourselves asking, is this ever going to end. But it's not just the pandemic. If we're really honest, we've been feeling this sense that something's off for quite some time, this malaise, this mistrust, this fear of the other. That's been happening with us for years, hasn't it? We have this innate sense as we look around that where we are as a world, as a nation, as a community, as a church, as individuals, is not where we're supposed to be. Not where we want to be. Not where we ought to be. We're a little lost. And with every school shooting, Every act of police brutality, every congressperson disparaging another congressperson, every angry email, every anonymous comment, every failure 
to look someone in the eye and work it out. Every time good people throw up their hands and say, what can you do? We veer further off course, lighting a candle of peace, but deep down not really believing it's possible. And when that happens, friends, when we find ourselves just going through the motions, keeping our heads down, putting one foot in front of the other, not paying attention to where we are, it doesn't take long before we find ourselves going out of our way. And when we're lost, there are really only two options. We admit it, or not. To be fair, so many of us would prefer the or not. It's a lot easier. It's the equivalent of taking the blue pill. We just put our heads down and we decide, well, everything looks good. I know exactly where I am. I know exactly where I'm going. And this all feels normal. Buying your 15-year-old a semi-automatic weapon, normal. Building up your own personal arsenal, normal. Shutting down the government every three months because we can't talk to one another, normal. 800 million people starving in our world while billionaires launch themselves into space, normal. We plug our ears and we close our no eyes and we hold our nose and we say, isn't this nice? It's so peaceful. But in our hearts, we know that it's not. We know that it's not true. And we can pretend like it is, but it doesn't make the problem go away. Look, we can sit and argue about a theory that asks us to think critically about race, that asks us to think about how race has played into our social ills, to the social inequities we have. We could even, whether out of cowardice or ignorance, get school boards to vote against it, but in the end, it doesn't make it less true. And if people who look like me spent even a fraction of the energy they've spent into, in put into not talking about racism, into actually turning to face it, we just might find ourselves a little less lost. But that's the challenge, isn't it? We don't like to talk about these things, especially in church. How many people have said, can we just come and sit here in peace. We hear this all week long. Can we just come and sit for a moment in peace? And the answer is yes. Sometimes. But it can't be all the time. If the world is on fire, we can't come in here and pretend like we don't smell like smoke. Especially when we have something that might help dampen the flames. You've heard me say before, I could come in and preach cotton candy every single week. And some people would love it. They'd prefer it. It'd make my life a lot easier and my family's life a lot easier. To never talk about anything that might upset someone, to never deal with anything that really matters. Never anything that might just make us a little uncomfortable. The church might even grow. But in the end, no body can survive on sugar alone, especially not the body of Christ. To talk about Jesus outside of the world in which we now live is to ignore 
the promise of the incarnation. It's to miss the point of the gospel entirely. See, Jesus, as contrary to popular belief, wasn't killed for telling people to love one another. He was killed for standing up to those oppressive systems that were harming people in his world. And newsflash, they didn't like it then any more than we like it now. We're here to be able to talk about the hard things when everybody else can't. That's why we're a church. Not that we have it all figured out, we don't. But we're here to try and figure it out together. The hope of the gospel, the promise of the gospel, is good news for the lost. That is, it is good news for us. But the only way to embrace it, the only way to have our lives changed by it, is to be willing to admit that where we are is not where we long to be. and then to work together to decide which way from here. Fortunately, we can get some help from those who came before. The second Sunday of Ad in Advent every year, we do two things. We light the candle of peace, and we tell the story of John the Baptist. John the, the story of John the Baptist is one of those few stories in our Gospels that is told in all four of them. All four talk about this man who went to the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, who gave his entire life to help others prepare the way of the Lord. We've heard about the wilderness before if we've been following along in Scripture. It's that place of uncertainty. It's that place where we're not quite sure where we're going. It's that place where so many of us feel lost. We hear it right from the very beginning. We hear it with Abraham and Sarah. We hear it with Moses and the Hebrew people. We hear it with David and Elijah and Elisha. And about a month, we'll hear it again when Jesus, right after he's baptized, heads to the wilderness. Only what we sometimes forget is that it's in that place of wilderness, that uncertain place, when people tend to hear God speaking the most. Even in our passage for today, it says that John the Baptist was in the wilderness when the Word of God came to him. Maybe some of you out there know the feeling. Maybe you know what it's like to find yourself a little lost in life, to be at one of those low moments and suddenly understand, suddenly have some kind of clarity. Sure, maybe it comes in a voice, but maybe not. Maybe it's just finally having an epiphany. We have to go low sometimes to finally find our way forward. In other words, sometimes, in order to get from where we are, to where we long to be. We have to go through the wilderness. Sometimes we have to be willing to get a little lost. I think we know the feeling. Only when we're lost, If we want to get going again, we have to choose a direction to head. John the Baptist offers that today. In the absence of a pillar of fire that will go before us, sometimes the only way to get going again when we're lost is to find a point in the horizon, some fixed point out there that is straight away, and just take the first couple of steps towards it. Though to be clear, we have to be careful about which point we choose. Maybe you know the story about the little boy who's trying to learn how to plow a field. 
And his dad comes to him and he says, look, all you have to do is pick a point in the horizon and follow it. That will help you keep a straight line. And then a couple of hours, a couple of hours later, the father comes back and he sees that the line is waved all over the field. And he asks his son, what happened? Didn't I tell you to pick a point in the distance? To which, at which point his son says, daddy, I did, but the rabbit kept moving. <laughs> if we want to find our way, We have to pick a point on the horizon that won't hop away from us. Which means it can't be political ideology that shifts from day to day, sometimes minute to minute. It can't be money or sex or position or power or privilege or success or grades because all of those things are fleeting. If we want to find our way again, and I believe we do, then we're going to have to find something out there when all else falls away that won't crumble. John the Baptist is showing us what it is. He suggests it. It's the way of the Lord. The good news is we know that way. Don't we? It's not a secret. We tell it every Sunday. We speak it every Sunday from there or from here. We know the way of the Lord. It's the way of love. And while that sounds really nice, all sunshine and roses, that's not the kind of love we're actually talking about. It's not romantic love. It's not the kind of love that just tells us what we want to hear. It's the kind of love that tells us the truth. It makes us stand up when we'd rather sit down, go when we'd rather say, speak, when it'd be so much easier to just stay quiet. But it's also the kind of love that leads to life. We know the way. But there's no device in our pocket that is going to tell us when we start to go off. That's why we have each other. Look, that's what a church is. We're people who come together and recognize that we're not perfect, but we're more perfect together than we are apart. We're people who are going to commit to one another to keep pointing each other in the way. The earliest Christians were called people of the way. This is who we are. We keep walking alongside one another. What do I say in every baptism that we do here? When I walk that child up or down the aisle, I say, these are the people who are going to be here to help support you so that along the journey of life, should you stumble or should you fall, they will help you get on your feet again. And all we ask is that you do the same for us. We are people who are going to walk alongside one another to find our way. But it's going to take leaning into a little grace. You remember grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Look, none of us are at our best right now. It's hard to be when you're lost. None of us are at our best. I'm not. So we're going to have to lean into a little grace with one another to find our way again. It means giving people the benefit of the doubt. It means not assuming the worst, but the best. It means pausing before we send that email, before we post that comment, before we share that gossip that is so juicy. Look, contrary to what the pundits say, the people who think differently than us are not our enemies. And frankly, even if they were, we are called to love them. That's how radical this way of the Lord actually is. Which means that it's okay to sit in the same pew with people who think differently than us. It's okay that your preacher will say things from time to time that you disagree with. It's okay to not have this all figured out. That's why we're here. Look, we're Methodists. John Wesley said, if your heart is like my heart, take my hand. 
Seems like John the Baptist was trying to say something similar. He was trying to remind us that despite all else that is going on in this world, despite feeling completely and utterly lost, here's the good news. We don't have to think the same way to face in the same direction. Do you hear? We don't have to think the same way to face in the same direction. And when we can all do that, when we can all point in that direction to the way of Christ, to the way of love, then as Isaiah said, it's a funny thing, the straight path will become clear. That all of those things we're convinced are so, uh, such obstacles to our finding our way again will suddenly not fade away. They will suddenly disappear. That is, the valleys shall be made low, the mountains the valleys will be filled, the mountains made low, the crooked ways made straight, and the rough ways made plain. And all flesh, all flesh will see the salvation of God. As disciples of Jesus Christ, friends, we're only lost if we forget the way. Have we? If not, then which way from here? Amen. Gracious, loving God, we open our hearts to you. Hear our prayers. We pray this morning with hearts heavy from scary news stories. We lift to you the loved ones of all who were killed this week. We pray for the ones who inflicted violence. We know your loving arms have already welcomed the souls of those who died. Take our burdens of worry and fear, anxiety and guilt, and clear a path within us for a deeper relationship with you. We pray this morning with hearts lightened by hearing your word, by singing songs of praise to you, and by knowing that there is hope for a future filled with peace. Enliven every cell in our bodies to work toward this peace. Prepare our hearts for the celebration of the birth of Jesus. Strengthen our souls to be the cornerstone of your redeeming love within us. Sever all ties to unhelpful thoughts. Break our bond with the human need to share in unholy conversation. Shift our entire beings to focus on your love and open us each and all to be 
the light of your love in this world. We pray that out your words are our words, that your heart is our heart, and that your breath is our breath. Amen. We are so grateful that you are here. We recognize that we are not a perfect place, but we're more perfect together than we are apart. We will keep finding our way towards something a little more resembling perfection, Christian perfection. Right now, we recognize <clears throat> that we are not the only people with us, and <clears throat> we say hello to those who are watching. We have 448 views right now in this moment, and those watching from the United States, from Belgium, from Canada, and from Mexico. We say hello to those watching from New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, New Jersey, Michigan, Michigan Massachusetts, Kansas, hi mom and dad, Minnesota, Colorado, Arizona, Nebraska, Connecticut, Ontario, Illinois, Brussels, uh, Tennessee, Jalisco, uh, Texas, and Delaware. Pardon my mispronunciations if that is the case. Uh, what a gift it is to recognize that we are all together in this moment. We, this afternoon, will have a, a time for us to begin the registration process for Christmas Eve. Speaking of grace, we are doing our best to have anticipated the questions that are going to come up, but undoubtedly there are going to be things that people will ask that we didn't think about as we put this together. So we just ask your patience and your grace as you do so. If you have, don't receive our emails, you can either sign up for our emails, which is a good thing to do, or you can go to our website, asburyfirst.org slash Christmas, and uh, click the link to be able to sign up for a Christmas Eve service there. We're asking, and at least initially, for people to just sign up for one so that we can make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be able to sign up. If you are not a person who has uh, email or access to a digital way of signing up, you, there are some forms at the desk that you can fill out at the welcome desk here, or you can call the church office at 585-271-1050, and we will do our best to get you set up for the service that you would like to go to. It is going to be a different year, but we will find our way, and it will be better to be together in this moment. We'd also ask that you think a little bit about the uh, various things that are happening within the life of the church, to look through your bulletin to see some of those opportunities, whether it's the Chris Wilson concert coming up or Annie, which has ha been rescheduled to happen next weekend as our youth have been working so hard for that. You have heard me say, oh, we've... We have immediately following the service today a, a brief, very brief church conference. We hope that it will be just a few minutes. There's only one task that we're able to talk about. We will keep the live stream on, but we have been told that we are not allowed to count votes that happen online for this. So with all respect, we love you and uh, consider you as a part of this, but we are not allowed right now to be able to take votes uh, virtually for this particular uh, church conference. So for those who are able to stay, we'd invite you to stay. We will keep the live stream going. For those who are watching, we invite you to stay for that and very brief church conference in order to vote on the Boy Scouts of America bankruptcy plan. That said, throughout this fall, and as we're thinking about coming back from COVID, one of the things that we've worked really hard to try and do is find a way for people to connect again. And the class meetings, the discipleship project, is one way of doing that. And we have a brief video that will help you see some of the ways those connections are already be, being made and maybe help you consider how you might take that next step in your journey with Christ. When I learned a little bit more about the class, I thought, this is great. You come to the table, well, so to speak, we gather with our other members and share what our week is like and how is our walk with God and how can we be better people together and we pray for each other and then we leave. I just found that to be very inspiring and inspirational in what I needed in my life today.
So on a deeper level, more than just developing relationships with other people in our church. When you sign up for music lessons, it makes you a better musician because you have to practice because you have to go to that lesson. Um, it's a little bit like that. This class really makes me think more about my spiritual life and how I'm living. I just felt as though everybody at church had a very vast education and I was the one that was lagging trying to figure out how to get back up, get up to where they were. I found out that we're all on a journey and uh, it helped me to feel like I really was in an okay place in church and that we're all on a journey at different levels. I think that every small group that I have been a part of in this church, and indeed in, in churches I belonged to before, has been rewarding, has been a positive experience, has allowed me to become uh, more closely associated with the congregation, just one person at a time, makes it easier to remember the name the face with the name, the story with the face with the name, the family with the story with the face with the name. And it, so it's building blocks. I think it's really important. And I think it's a marvelous thing that, that Asbury's doing this during the, the thought that this is historically how the Methodist Church really developed in the United States. Is just, and to think that we can do that again with with meaning afresh. I think it's just a terrific idea. We call our small groups classes after the original Methodist discipleship groups. Join us as we work together to integrate our faith and action. The Discipleship Project. Reclaim the method. Renew the mission. Reignite the movement. We'd invite you to think about whether or not you are ready to take the next step in your faith journey as we will have new classes that are beginning right in the new year. It may be an excellent time to begin that next step. We have them both virtually and in person, so there should be, our hope is there's something and an opportunity for everyone. With that said, we give thanks to all the ways that God has given us as we consider in this moment our offering as the offertory anthem is sung.
Emmanuel, God with us, we offer our gifts in gratitude for the wondrous things you have done in our midst. May we overflow in generosity and good deeds as we make ready for the arrival of your reign. endless song above earth's lamentation. I hear that still but far off voice that hails a new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Amen.